Okay, now we're here to talk about aesthetic pruning. We know that some of the gardeners don't necessarily do aesthetic pruning. <laughs> yeah. um, it's something that takes a lot of training and, and practice and may not be done with an electric hedge trimmer. It may not be the best tool. Uh, let me just put it that way. So um, we were looking for uh, somebody to do this talk on pruning. I, I read Leslie's book and I thought she would be really great. And even though she, she'll explain, talking about Japanese gardens, they're native gardens. So please help me to welcome Leslie Walker. If I talk, you really have to use the Okay, I'm just when I'm doing the pruning, I don't know that. We can take that out. Oh, okay, there good. You go. That's and I can hold it for you or whatever. It's just going to be better. Hi. Um, thank you all for coming. And thank you to Sherry and Lisa, in particular, California Native Plant Society and the library for hosting me here. Let's see, are we going to turn the lights off? No, not yet. No, not no. yet. Yeah, great. Yeah, and, um, and uh, I was curious before I start my talk and my demo, um, how many people here are interested in learning pruning? Okay, very few. <laughs> Just about 99%. And how many people here are interested in um, Japan? And how about native gardens? Okay, it's, we're going to cover this. Yeah, and they're all topics we're going to cover together, actually. Um, well, my name is Leslie Buck, and can I take this off? Okay, and this is, you'll see me up here pruning. I like to have this as I'm doing my intro, because this is my normal um, outfit and what I do during the week. I don't normally write or give lectures. I'm out there pruning. And um, all over the Bay Area. And I went to Japan to learn more high-end natural pruning and did an apprenticeship there and ended up writing a memoir called Cutting Back. And um, that is what brought me here to you all. And I, I'm, why am I here at a, at a California Native Plant Society meeting if I did a book on Japanese gardens? That's, sometimes we were like, what? Um, and uh, the thing I learned, what I suspected, what I'd heard about, but what I learned while I was there was how natural the gardens actually were in Japan. And, um, I'm going to do two things during this talk. I'm going to do um, a pruning demo, just to show you guys like a taste of natural pruning, and that by that aesthetic pruning sometimes is what I call it. When I prune a tree afterwards, you can't tell it's been pruned. That's my goal. Like that very minute I finish and I slowly egg something towards what I want. I always say a landscaper throws paint on the canvas and as an aesthetic pruner, I move around the paint um, because you can let a tree get five feet tall or 60, you can go right or left, it can be open or really tightly closed. So the aesthetic pruner controls all that. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to do this pruning demo first so that when I was, I do have a lot of slides from Kyoto where it's not just going to be a fun slideshow. You guys are going to have to really think because I'm going to be teaching you tricks of how to develop a garden over time with your pruning so that your garden has a natural feel. Because as an aesthetic printer, it's not just the pruning I do, I'm designing the garden over time. Um, and I thought it'd be easier if I showed you the pruning first, you kind of get, when I say, oh, here's how you can, you know, prune this way to get that. 
Sound good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Can you just tell us what kind of a shrub yeah. or plant that is that you're on the slideshow? Oh, that's a camellia. Oh, actually, so yeah. And I have a lot of native plants, but the one video I took um, was of a camellia japonica, I believe. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. You know, I got my training at Merritt Horticulture School, Merritt College. They have a whole pruning program. And we have a huge amount of aesthetic pruners there. And one of our members, our oldest, he's definitely older than me now. He's about my age, actually. One of our uh, long-term members, Peter Boyer, he does a program here at Hakone, Japanese Gardens, where he brings in all kinds of people, including aesthetic pruners. So you can learn aesthetic pruning there, too. So this is going to be interesting. And the deal is, if you make a cut at an intersection, just hormonally, it when it does a reactionary, because you know plants, I think of it like you, you cut it, it thinks it's being eaten, or it thinks it's broken or something, so it reacts. There's all kinds of scientific, but this is just the easiest way for me to think about it. It reacts. So, but if you do it at an if you make a cut at an intersection, it tends to react less. If you do it anywhere else, you'll get maybe three or four sprouts. It really thinks something's munched it. So there's something hormonally about when you do it in an intersection, it might not react at all, no, or it might just do one. You can't control it, but this is a way to reduce the growth, which is mostly what we're all trying to do. Yeah, it's like these things have gotten too big, or too thick, or too much in the way. So we have to get it back. And um, in the old days, we just like cut it, get it out of the way so I don't have to think about it. And then it just reacts, and then it gets worse the next year. But this method, I'm going to, oh, say here's the walkway. Old day, I would just cut it. It would spurt four sprouts the next year, and I'd have an even bigger problem. And I cut those, and I do eight, and it gets so thick that it would die out inside, and I could no longer cut it back. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to make a nice cut at an intersection, which is right there. Or I could go further down. I see another intersection. And there's all, I'm simplifying this, but there's all kinds of tricks about how to keep this natural looking. Not, um, so say, so there's an intersection, so say I just want to get this a little bit smaller. <coughs> intersection, intersection, <coughs> intersection. Are you planning how much of the stem is Oh. A little stuff. Um, the collar. How much you're leaving? Yeah. And what was the question again? I think she's asking, are you concerned about how right. much you're leaving? The Am stuff? I concerned about how oh. much stuff I'm leaving? Oh right, no stuff. Yeah. That's very easy. I never leave a stub big enough for a mouse to hang its hat on. <laughs> That's a mouse hat. But there's a tiny bit left, but not big enough. It's very easy. My Japanese friend, she goes, who's a pruner, Yukinara, she's, did you just say big enough for a mouse to hang its hat? <laughs> um, it's funny. Can you guys see that stub? Yes. Isn't that amazing? Make these, not this one, but that one. Yes. That one. It's funny. Make it clean. Um. Like you can't see it anymore. That far away. So this, if you practice making cuts where you're just, you're not leaving any Big enough for the mouse hat, it, it, it relaxes the mind. So go a little slower and make a proper cut. 
there's all kinds of tricks of how not to cut too far, but we're going to do the basics here, and then I'm going to tell you where to get more info. Um, so that got smaller, but you can't really tell. I pruned it. Yeah? So a couple other quick, you know, I'm pruning coarse. I'm leaving fine if I had to keep going. Prune cores, leave fine. So next year there'll be more fine, and I'll prune the cores. And that's how you keep it small. You're doing these thinning cuts, but you're always pruning cores and leaving fine. And that way the plant is always has this nice fine growth on the outside. Is that clear enough? Okay. No, I'd like that clarified. What is cores and what fine? Yeah, anything that like. If I have to decide between pruning this one or that one, this one's thicker. I'm having to decide whether to prune this one that's actually taller or this one that's shorter. But this one's thicker. So if I prune that, then next year there'll be something fine and this will become coarse. And each year we'll keep going because when you look at any tree in nature, like right now I've maintained the outside being fine still. Every single tree you see in nature, the outside is fine. It's always fine on the outside. I don't care if you end up having to go super coarse or super fine if it's hidden, you know? Because as long as that outside looks fine, I mean, it'd be better if you're gradual, course to fine, if you're graceful, you know, that's always better. These are all, I'm going really fast. <laughs> but, um, so I always want that outside to be fine. And that's why we say, oh, we don't like hacking. You know, that pruner's pruning cuts, you know, they're mass they massacre. My, my husband, don't touch my tree anymore. <laughs> it's the it's because we're actually quite skilled in pruning. We look at, we've looked at nature all these years and we've noticed that the outside's always fine. So when people leave a coarse stub, it looks weird to our eye, but we just couldn't say why. And that's why, because nature is always fine on the outside. Then fine being more new growth, coarse being old growth? Mm, new coarse could be old growth because sometimes Sherry has an old maple and I was noticing it's only growing half an inch a year it looks like. So the old growth is actually quite thin. No, it's just fine means less than a toothpick or toothpick size. As, as fine as the tree can get. On an apple tree it might be chopstick, you know. So let's try another technique, it's heading, and that's not at an intersection. It's that anywhere, I do try and do to a leaf bud, though. But it creates, remember what I was saying? Like you, you prune something and the plant think it's being eaten, so it sends out reactionary and so maybe I'll get six new growth, and then the next year it kind of looks like that. And that's what we normally do, which is shearing. When we shear, we're heading. We're just cutting anywhere. And sometimes the shrub is a little bit too thin, or sometimes the beauty of a shrub is that multiple growth. Can somebody think of one we desire besides a hedge? What kind of plant, there's two kinds I'm thinking of where we desire more growth to encourage the beauty. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Dang it. Got me. Okay, besides the lawn, which is herbaceous. 
Because a beauty is something, each tree has its own beauty, like maples, like pines, it's the bark. And I'll show you a lot of pictures showing off that bark. Um, cherries, what's the beauty? Wow. Yeah. Azaleas, what's the beauty? Wow. How do you get a lot of flowers on azaleas? Uh, pretty good growth. Yeah, so a lot of heading on azaleas. How about apples? What's the beauty? <laughs> yeah. How do you get a lot of, a lot of little apples? Just a, a very short branch that happens. It's a short stub. Is an apple spur. It's a short branch that happens to put out an apple. So how do you get a lot of, lot of apples? Yeah. So apple trees, you actually do a lot of heading cuts. You're, you're actually shearing. And I asked an arborist once, do you think apple tree pruning is shearing? And he's like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Well, you know who said that? Stu Winchester. Does anybody else know Stu Winchester, the master of doing native plant tours throughout California through Diablo College and Merritt College? And that's why I, I love natives more than any plant. I love California natives more than any plant in the world, even more than Japanese garden plants. That's why I went to Japan, because I love natives and they love natives. They're equally passionate. Um, so you do this shearing, and so say I want this to get thicker, because there's a house behind here. So I just cut at This is more thin looking, so I'm just going to cut at leaf buds. Cut. 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 Not very beautiful. Um, sometimes, usually what I do is I, to reduce the size, here's sometimes what I, I'll um, make a cut. I'm trying to reduce. Make this thinner, and then there's like just a little something sticking out, so I do a, a heading. Like some, usually I do thir um, three fourths thin cuts, and there's usually something sticking up, and I do some heading. And at the very end, just to clean it up, because sometimes there's just nothing, there's no more intersections to cut to. So, or I'm using it to do a little bit of cutting on its alias, making them thicker. A plant like that, or a plant that's just too open. But usually, I do thinning, because we're always trying to get plants smaller. To your point about having the thin side looking very natural, mm -hmm. uh, if you take the camellia that's very grown up like a pillar that is against something, would you uh, head the back side and thin the front side? To open it up and make it a little more natural? Um, say I have a camellia on the edge of a fence, and you're saying you want it thicker? No, you, you want, want it to be more open and look more natural versus yeah. the one you're working on in the video, mm -hmm. where it's just a solid camellia. Yeah, I'm trying to open this up, yeah, exactly. actually, and keep it a little bit smaller. Right. And you can't see it, but there's a, a room to the right, and the tree's really sticking out, so I'm trying to get the tree back. It's not necessarily down, because there's a house behind it. So I want to keep it high, but I don't want it to stretch wide anymore. So that's I'm trying to bring it in, but I'm leaving the height. And I don't mind the thickness, because it's screening. So, but a lot of camellias, it is nice to open them up, because they're so pretty when the light dapples through, but you have to be careful what's behind it. So um, the last cut I'm gonna go is tipping, and it is the littlest cut, and it has the most power. And it's just, well, here's a great example of a, see how that one's just sticking up? Yeah. Um, I could take it to, it's hard to find an intersection, so I'm gonna take it just to a leaf bud. Isn't that nice? Now it's got a perfect, 
it doesn't tree stone have to be perfectly round or but it, it does have this invisible dotted line look at any tree in nature it has an invisible dotted line around it even if it's undulating so um tipping at the very end i just the half an inch because remember how i was saying like with heading sometimes i just even rub the bud off that's tipping or in the spring i actually tip it that's tipping because Remember how I was saying this whole thing about the animals munching? We have a saying, little cut that gets little reaction, coarse cut that gets coarse. Don't get too focused on this. Mostly think about intersections for a while. But little cut, the tree's just going to send out a little. Big cut, it's going to think major issue. Major. <laughs> Go for the gold. It's going to want to go straight up fast. Many, 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 many. So if I confuse the plant, like I make all these cuts, and at the end I just, you know, I make all these cuts usually, and then it starts to react, and it sends out shoots. And then after a couple months, I tip those, because it's like, oh my god, something ate me. I have to grow. I have to grow. Wait, does that make sense? This is kind of what it's doing. It's not thinking that, but but then I tip it. I just do a half inch, little, and it's like, ooh, maybe, maybe I was wrong. Maybe it's just I'm brushing a wall. Cause you know how when trees hit walls, they stop growing. The wall, it's being tipped. When the wind hits it, it stops growing. The wind's tipping it. These are all examples of tipping, and that if we had tons of time and we just tipped, our plants just wouldn't even grow. You know, they stay exactly where we want. But sometimes we don't have time to do all that, so we make the shortcut, you know, we do bigger cuts. And then we follow up, and I'll often just do a little tipping. So those are the three cuts that I'm going to show you. I'm teaching pruning at Green Gulch next weekend for a whole day. And um, I also teach at Merritt College Horticulture School. And like I said, there, there are actually pruning classes at Hakone. Not many people can attest to having an aesthetic printer in their very town. I mean, there are no aesthetic printers in the United States, hardly, except you know, our area has the only school in the country except for Portland just started a school, Portland Japanese Garden. So it's special, and this is all about natural pruning that I'm talking about. So I'm going to show you some photos of my adventures in Japan, and in a way, prove to you why Japanese if we're interested in native gardening, we should be studying what the Japanese are doing and teaching us, because they are the masters of native landscaping. We have so much to learn from them, and we're all so afraid of them. We don't, we're totally misunderstanding what they're doing here in the United States. Um, but, oh, keep going. Lights. Yeah, lights. And any questions? No? Yes. Feel, please feel free to ask questions as I go along. I will be looking. Does your book describe these steps? So does my book describe these steps? No. <laughs> I wanted to do an addendum. <laughs> that might have to be another book. I'd like to go around and just do printing classes everywhere. Because um, there's so much need for Aesthetic pruning. Yes. What about guidelines of how much percentage of foliage you want? Yes. Are there guidelines of how much? Yes. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do more than thirty percent. Easy rule. If it's diseased or weak, don't do more than five percent. If it's strong and you've done thirty percent and it works fine, you can go all the way up to sixty, eighty. But you don't do it till you know either you know what you're doing or you know the plant. 
even me, I can't tell certain plants. Pines are the most sensitive, and that's why it's amazing that Japanese in Japan they work with pines because they're they're very old plants. They don't heal well. You know, they you make a cut in one area. If it weakens one area, it weakens the whole plant because it's so ancient in its makeup. Most trees can just kind of compartmentalize that branch, but um, most plants, you know, no more than 30%, you're, you're good. And always look at it before you start and kind of think about how much you think you want to remove and keep stepping back and looking at it. You never remove more than it starts looking unnatural. And you know what that means. So 30%, then can you do, you know, if it's a plant that really needs a lot, then the, can you wait a year to yeah. do another 30%? Yeah, absolutely. Because you've got to see if it, does it give no reactions? Because then you better start being careful the following year. Or does it grow back equally? Then you got to do a little more. So I'm more interested in what the reaction is than what it looks like when I first get to it. So that's why I do a test run the first year and just do the cuts, see how it reacts, especially when we don't know if we're going to hit drought or rain year. Thank you. So here I am up in a tree. Uh, this is a, my client, Everell Mitchell. And if anybody sees, if you go on my website, I have all these appearances. But one, I'm going to be doing a tour of this garden. Um, which is a Japanese uh, design garden by Shibiri Namba, who built Ariel Ellison's garden. Um, so the Aesthetic Pruning, Pruners Association is doing a whole tour of three different gardens, and one of them is this one. So you can come see it. It's a really cool one. It has some natives. I've been trying to get, <laughs> get natives in there. Portland Japanese Garden uses natives about a quarter. 10 percent. Um, so here's, I'm going to go over, I believe it's 11 points here of design of a native garden that Japanese gardeners I noticed focusing on, and there's many more. I'm a pruner, so I design gardens over time, but I don't do design installation, so there's much more than what I'm saying. And um, I would like to say there's somebody in the audience who's in the book, Diane Renshaw. <laughs> Could you raise your hand? Diane is a native landscaper in the area, and she's actually in the book. Because <laughs> we see each other at Tassahara quite a bit, um, where I do print, volunteer pruning. So as natural as possible, I once was sharing a shrub in Japan, and I talk about this in the book, and I was really getting pissy because I'm like, I didn't come to Japan to be sharing. That's what, you know, everybody thinks they're sharing. And I turned to my um, one coworker who spoke English, and I said, you know, everybody in America thinks that all Japanese gardens are sheared. And he said, I don't like it any more than you do. <laughs> he always knew what I was up to when I was trying to make a comment. And he said, just tell them, Leslie, Japanese gardens are, we're trying to get them as natural as possible. That is the goal. Please tell them that. So I'm telling you that. Let's show you. I mean, this whole, every bit of this is pruned. There's always, a few shared plants, usually, in a garden, but they're always the minimum. They're always maybe 10%, 20%. Most of it's natural. But shared plants kind of pop out and focus. Every bit of this is created by man. The stones are set. All the ferns are picked. The dead stuff's picked off in the winter so that it comes out fresh. The plants don't go too far over or too far over the rocks. You can see how they can thin these. Every bit of this pruned. Every bit of this landscaped. Yeah, the river flowed through, but there wasn't that walkway. 
There weren't big rocks on the side. There weren't these trees coming over. This has been developed for over 350 years, this garden. But does that look fairly natural to you guys? It's hard doing a natural garden. Like, how do you keep it looking natural once you plant it? Because they all, everything just wants to grow together. Um, and that's where aesthetic pruning, pruning comes into play. Sometimes you have to open it, sometimes you have to get, you know, one thing's taken over another, you have to decide who gets that preference. The bigger trees start shading out, so you have to get light to come in. And um, here's a camellia that um, I got to prune one camellia in Japan. <laughs> Um, and you can see I was just opening it up very gently and there you can see it's undulating but there is that invisible dotted line it was about a foot and a half taller and mostly when the gardens in the private homes the trees are mostly kept about 15 20 feet tall max I think that's a fairly good rule of thumb because otherwise it would shade these small gardens too much, right? Unless the whole thing was a shade garden, you could have one big shade tree. But most gardens, you know, are a little combination of some evergreen, some deciduous, and um, so in the winter there's a little evergreen. And, and then if you're going to keep that maple that normally goes 30 to 40 feet, 20 feet, 15 feet, then you got to keep the camellia that can get up to 30 feet, you got to keep it below the maple. So the garden, so maybe you keep the camellia 10 feet or 6 feet. And then the azalea, which we all know can get up to 4 feet, you got to keep it 2 feet. So if you're doing a native garden, same thing. Coffee berry can get up to 20 feet. And the um, red bud can get up to 25, 30. I've kept red buds about 20 feet, and then maybe a coffee berry. Let's see, at the Green Gulch um, Tea Garden, there's some coffee berries I was keeping at about four, my height, <coughs> four, five, five feet. Um, and then the Manzanita, you know, maybe that has to be a little bit lower. Now, I'm not saying that every manzanita should be kept here and every coffee berry. I mean, I have coffee berry in my garden. Some of them, I'm letting them get 20 feet tall because I want to screen from seeing the house. Other ones, I'm keeping only three feet tall because I just barely want to screen a hammock, but I want you to see a tree behind it. And so, but every plant is in perspective with the other. You don't just let it go and then hack at it if it's too big. It's like you're really thinking, where do I, you have all this control. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible option once you know how to do pruning. Will you get a chance to mention what seasons to prune, you know, like for instance, camellias? This is, in yeah, what? Married Horticulture School, they have like, Mm, one to two classes a month describing all that scene. <laughs> and it took me about four years to learn everything. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's a lot. Um, but native plants, it, I can pretty much, I hate to say it, but I can pretty much prune it year round, like when it needs it which is generally late spring or late summer, because that's when it's done its thing. But if I don't have time, I could get to it in winter. I just hope I haven't killed anything off by waiting. Only Japanese gardens, there's certain times you just don't want to open maples in the hot, when it's really sunny. That's like a very specific one. Um, also, if flower buds are developing in midsummer, well, so you want to prune it right after it blooms so that you prune it quickly and then whatever develop becomes the next year's flower bud. So that's another one. So the, does that, it kind of, 
But in general, I like doing native gardens because I can do them more year round. There's a lot of evergreen. Manzanitas, I can do twice a year, right after spring, do that. And then they do this one more growth that's really straggly, and I just, I do heading cuts of that. Because it's not like the spring growth is everything. Do thinning cuts back. And then in the summer, it does just these whips, and I just head those back. Keep it fairly natural looking. In fact, I've opened up manzanitas that have been sheared for years and years and opened them. I saw another question. Here's another. So I was just showing you some examples of how the guards. No. Still, why are we doing Japanese gardens here? We're a native plant, but something about these gardens is very particular that is goes with why we are here for native plants. Can anybody tell me what's particular about all these gardens I've shown you that you don't see in the United States? That 100%, maybe 98, 100% of their plants are native to Japan. Almost always when they do gardens, they're only using native plants to, to Japan. We don't do that here. We just use every plant under the sun in, <laughs> in America. Um, and they tell me, Leslie, don't, when you build a Japanese-inspired garden, which is really just a garden that has a feeling of nature, that has, it's not necessarily a copy of nature. Sometimes it can be a copy of a slice of nature. If, you, if that helps you, just copy a slice of nature, like that scene with the red bud and the manzanita and the huckleberry. But it's more the feeling, it has the essence, the feeling of nature. Because um, nature's not always going to look that good. But maybe there's certain spots that have been there so long, they're just settled. And that's the nature we're seeking. They say, don't copy our nature, use your own. I've heard this from many Japanese gardeners. I mean, they all think it. It's just some of them say it. Um, and their understanding, even they go, Kyoto, people outside Kyoto try and copy Kyoto forests. It drives us crazy. They should, they're in Osaka, they should do an Osaka garden with some palm trees. If they're near the water, they should do gardens that reflect the waters. If they're in the mountains, they should do gardens that reflect the mountains. If you want to do a mountain garden, go to the mountains and find some scenes. If you want to do a meadow garden, go to the meadow. Look in your area. What do you find? Where do you find inspiration? So a slice of nature. Very few gardens are miniaturized in Kyoto. And if they are, believe me, the Western tourists are there taking photos. Because <laughs> they're interesting, and we're interested in what's fascinating. The ones that are really natural, they just look like the forest. They really don't take very good photos. So we often bring back photos of the more odd ones. But these look fairly natural. Here's a tea garden. It's made so that you have a lot of um, chunks of trees that they thin out and just keep the top slightly open. So you have this feeling, even though it's just a small space of a front yard, that you're in a forest. See how all the trunks are kind of slender and upright? So that's a tr trick if you want to create like this feeling, because their tea houses are often, you know, this place where you, you're going inward. But tea houses can be any Whatever makes you relax. What makes you relaxed? So if you want a tea garden, if you want a garden that when you enter, it relaxes you, what makes you relax? Is it sunshine? Is it shade? Is it the meadow? And um, do, do that. Here's, once again, See the 15 feet, or 20, 
20 feet. Two stories of a house is about 20, 20 feet. How um, everything's kind of kept in perspective. These are mad, these are oak, deciduous oaks. They're just thinning these like crazy. Once again, you know, just some tree trunks and a couple shrubs. Done. Looks a little, they're trying. Okay, finally made it. This is my garden. <laughs> I'm trying to do, a, I'm practicing doing a Japanese inspired garden in my backyard. And I'm on the Bring Back the Natives tour, so you can come see how I'm doing after a couple of years. I got my toyon to block the neighbors. I got my coffee berry going, and I got some little huckleberry shrubs that are going to take a lot of time to get taller. Um, and I thought, what is relaxing to me? And what's the relaxing spot to most Americans? We don't even know our nature anymore. And I was like, hey, the campground. Almost everyone knows the campground. So I thought, I'm going to make something that's the essence of the campground, because it's so relaxing to me. So I'm playing with this idea of what's so relaxing. Because it is, the Japanese gardens are, because you know when you walk through the forest, it gives you that time to, to think, or the time to talk to a friend, or maybe the time to pray, or to get inspired. It gives you space to do what you want. Well, that's what they're trying to do in these nature-inspired gardens. We call Japanese gardens. To them, they're nature-inspired gardens. It's a place where there's room for you to think. It's not trying to do miniaturized little hedges that represent the mother, the father, you know, the, the animal. No, it's just supposed to look like nature, so you have room to think how you want to think. Those are more authentic. This was in Arkansas. Does that look pretty natural to you? Every rock was set by David. He did the water. He did, he uses native plants. He's a master. I wanted to show that because mine is so pitiful, my attempt. This is somebody who studied in Japan, you know, um, many years and has come back. And he's one of the best uh, landscapers in the United States. And he's in the Midwest, and he's done, um, if you go on his website, he sells an incredible video on thinking about going to nature to find inspiration to build our local native gardens. And he has always tried to encourage us to look at our local plants and he's okay with using some others you know being not too strict but <coughs> must be into local. here's a native garden that I pruned that I'm just playing with keeping shrubs and trees to block the neighbors but he loves biking through on this path so we kept the path nice and open I must have spent an hour on that grass because there was so much dead and going into the path, so I was pulling it back, but it still looks natural. Every little plant was pruned in this garden. Yep. Is that kind of bush in front of the door? Probably, yeah. I think so. I love pruning kyrie bush. It's so underrated. All you do is clean it out. And, and do a lot of heading because it tends to get straggly. It actually, I like to head it. And it has this beautiful open forms. Such a bad name just because, just like manzanita, you just clean it out. This isn't, like if you have a painting that's got dust all over it, it just doesn't look the same as if you clean it. And in nature, the wind would have cleaned it, the fire would have cleaned it. It's not like we're doing something that's unnatural. We're just speeding nature up a little. How they do viewing points is important. Like they really, in Japan, they often view from inside. This is actually a garden in Orinda. They're, you know, have these rooms where you open up. Now this is 
got a lot of shared azaleas. My client, mostly azaleas tend to be shared in Japan, but I don't think, I wonder if how long that's happened, because I don't think they have to be shared. You get a million flowers when you do this. It really is, and it's very rhythmic, and it's very meditative to actually do the pruning. Um, but if you looked, if you were sitting there, you'd see the whole garden is completely natural. But you take this shot and it looks like the whole garden is sheared. <laughs> I was a little afraid to show it, but I just wanted to show how I love the way the Japanese can look from inside. I want everyone to go to their homes and what we, we so cut off our gardens from inside. Like what, we only think of looking at the garden when we're outside, but actually, if you think of looking at the garden from when you're inside, you increase the size of your room, because your room gets bigger, and you increase the length of time you get to see a garden, because we're often working hard, and we don't have time to go outside. Just move those barbecues. Move, move away the tables and chairs. What do I see? Create a view that's made for the window. Um, and I talk about this in the National Japanese Garden Association. They're, they're going to put a, if you're a member, you get a magazine, and I have a big article on this topic of viewing point and how important that is to developing a garden. Here's the viewing point in the Everill's garden um, up in the hills that the Aesthetic Pruners Association is doing the tour with next month. This is a redwood, and I keep it 15 feet tall. And she just sees it outside her door. She doesn't need it taller than that. It's just so when she opens the door, she feels like there's a redwood forest. And you'll see, it looks completely natural. I had to prune it three times a year. I had to keep creating little tops that were small. I had to prune it so it looked small and thin out the bottom. Now I only have to prune it once a year. It's slowed down. It's so beautiful. You open that door and you just feel like there's mere woods. But then you step outside and it's still sunny. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. The trunk isn't growing as fast as it should. I'm curious still if the trunk, my mentor said the trunk's going to get bigger and bigger. There's no way you can stop it. He does bullseye. But so far, we're on year 20. It's doable still. The other redwoods we had to cut down. Here's an interesting view outside a window I created outside my bathroom window. I don't know, I just wanted to put this one in as a God, every time I go into the bathroom now, instead of seeing an apartment building, I see a little garden. And no one can see me because I put this little shade using a shelf, a little shelf bracket. You can see how it is? And it just creates this magical room inside my bathroom that I didn't. It used to just be a closed room. So there's something about this, the view looking outside our windows. OK, bigger view. There's viewing from just one viewpoint, like from inside a window. And then there's viewing from when you're walking around a garden. And I wanted to make sure we have till 7.30 or? No, well, it's 8 now. We have half hour. Half hour more, OK. So I'm going to go 15 minutes more. And then I'm going to take questions for 15 minutes. And then if people want to buy any books, they can. So multiple points. This is, a, you know, some gardens in Japan are big. They're public gardens. So the trees can be much bigger. They go all the way up into the hills. And you see the garden from multiple points. So sometimes when I have a garden that me or my assistant here are looking at, I go to those points. I go to getting out of the car. I make sure I go in their house. I, where do you sit in the garden? Where do you see the garden from? And I look, and I try and figure out where they're seeing the garden from, because that helps me decide you know, if there's a house I need to screen, or um, you know, how big or how small. I'm walking past this garden that I planted a lot of bleeding heart and native ferns, and I, there's a 
building right next to it, so I put in some um, coffee berry to try and screen the building. So I'm adding native plants, and then over time, the coffee berry, I'll let it get big, but I won't let it come out too much, because there's not much space here, but I'll try and let it get tall. And um, I can't let this pieris get any too big, because otherwise it will throw off the coffee berry being a big tree. So the pieris is going to act like a little shrub. <laughs> so I kind of get this sense of perspective. And I'll walk along the path and look at the viewing point there from different places. And this is Everill's garden again. There's just as you walk, there's different viewing points. One trick the Japanese use, I noticed, they don't just do random flowers. They only do flowers if it states a season. Season is what's important, not multicolor year-round. Um, if they do a Western garden, <laughs> they always mess up because they do these seasonal. They don't get that you have to put a million flowers in, and it just has to be flowers year-round. <laughs> they do these seasonal plants, and it just it looks too like the forest. <laughs> um, so here's spring. This is a spring look. What would be a spring look for a native garden? <coughs> See this, yeah. Summer. Here's the summer cherry. What would be summer? for a native garden. Sticky monkey, Sticky monkey yeah, all summer. And fall. Well, we, in Japan, it's fall color. What happens here in the fall? Not necessarily. I mean, sometimes fall color, but... Oh, berries, like toyon? Yeah, the berries. Yeah, and sometimes it's, we're, green. we're still green. We're not fall color. We have to think, what's our fall? Winter there is that deciduous and the beauty of the bare branches all um, they're exposed and um, some, I guess it's somehow sensitive. It's showing definitely the pruner, if he's good or bad, it shows up in in Japan. So we always say that's when you know who's who. But here, it's most, what is it here in winter? What is the look? The most green part of the year, right? So, you know, our seasons would be different, but we definitely wouldn't be having a million flowers, still trying to get flowers to come out, you know? It's more, well, yeah, spring we get flowers, but winter is green, 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 more lush. So just start looking, what is it you, love about each season and bring that out in your garden. Have you ever, does anyone grow um, buckeye? Yeah, garden? I have a the Japanese garden with a huge, huge window that has a big buckeye. It's great because it gives sunlight to the Japanese pines just when they need it every year. But it's tricky. Buckeyes, they have that beauty of age. I'm so glad you mentioned this because Japanese love to show off age in a garden. It just has such depth, poet, poetic beauty. Um, and this rotting stump, and then this little branch is trying to keep it going. I mean, that's just so beautiful. It's so, if you just had like a little co new coffee berry there, I just could not compare to this tree trunk. So keep some of the older, Consider keeping older things in your garden. This twisting trunk. And this ugly cherry that looks like it's on its last breath. Look how beautiful it is. They just cherish some of these things. I mean, you don't have to keep everything. I'm always like, Somebody asked me to prune the deadwood of this old apricot, and I was like, cool. Um, I did 30%, you know, I'm like, it looks like haunted house look. You don't want a haunted house look. You just want the best decaying branches. 
It could even be an object that has this age. Because who stood under this? Who's used that boat? It makes you think about all the people that have been there before you. It makes a depth of time in a garden that's not there with the new maple and the new cherry. You know, everybody wants to start over. So it's just that age is something else. Depth perception, I'm going. Um, there are these little tricks, like putting stuff in the foreground. See how on the bottom right, there's a table and chairs, and there's this little plant. Like, usually we're like, clear the way so you can see the garden. But there, they'll put something right in front. And it's just like the sketch I did, where that tree in front makes you feel like the lake is so huge. Imagine if I hadn't sketched that tree in front, or that little tiny kind of old young tree trying to grow in the sketch that cover those up and it's hard to know how deep the lake is so having that one thing in the foreground makes you have this depth perception sometimes they'll put a little thing in the background this maple at the portland japanese garden is actually just five feet tall and you walk right past it, but they open it and they planted, I noticed this little plant, little one in the background, and it makes this five feet tall seem huge. And see in the sketch, that one little tiny sailboat? Imagine that sailboat wasn't there, the little tiny one in the background. The ocean wouldn't look as deep, would it? So they're using painting tricks in their gardens to create depth in small spaces. You can too. Formal, this is just added a little advanced formal versus informal. You know, why do they, if you have a frame, well, I once had my friend Kay in the book come visit, and I was trying to create a little Tilden Park in my front yard. <laughs> and I had made like a little pond, and I had my little Ceanothus and my red bud. And he spent four hours pruning a Japanese boxwood hedge to the right, where some trash cans were. And I was like, why did you spend all that time on the... He's like, hmm. And I was like, why did you do that? And he goes, well, look now. Next to the clean boxwood, doesn't your plants look more natural now? And I was like, yeah. Now I have something to compare it to. So that's why... They feel they do sometimes sheared hedges and or formal architecture lines or like formal hedges. Um, I'll get to the other one. They it shows off how wild the other thing is. So there's a sense of formal informal in their gardens. There are these balances, filled versus empty. You know. Really, I mean, here's an empty space that, which is more filled, the shadows or the tree? It's kind of interesting. Oops. Here's like formal can be the walkway, filled versus empty can be the two sides. The architecture can be formal, the plants on the right. It, it's a balance. It's not all or nothing. The last thing that I do mention in my book, I start bringing out is this really subtle thing that the gardeners are teaching me. They never talked about heart or kokoro, which means heart, um, when I was in Japan. But as I was writing the book, I realized I was learning something about this that I heard about in Japanese garden conferences and that I kept asking people about, what are you talking about? This is the name of the conference and no one's talked about it. Uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. They want us to learn skills. Thinning, heading, you know, do that, do, do the heading, do the thinning, do the tipping, do that year after year, year after year. You'll start noticing things around you in the 
garden. <coughs> it's just you know, we don't figure out about this. And it's these are little three times a day we'd be served um, tea by our clients if they were home. And we can read about all this interaction I had with the the people, um, the homeowners. And it's them, hey, you're working hard for me and my garden, thank you. Really beautiful. Sometimes the finest pastry, sometimes Twix bars. <laughs> sometimes Fanta there. I think for the American, and green tea for the guys. Check out what I found one day. <laughs> That's in Japan. I was like, what's who? Oh, I just made my day. Who are these mystical people? Uh, just a little surprise. Uh, my sister, she was so happy to be in Japan. It's about the people visiting these gardens we love. It makes our smile. It's about our interaction with the plants, about with animals in the gardens, maybe about meeting people in the gardens, or me meeting my clients. I feel like the gardens orchestrate this for us. They bring us all together. And this is something I'm slowly, kind of, I'm slowly learning about in my book as I work. Because that's all they ask, is just that we be in the garden, um, interacting. And things happen. We all know what those things are that are so special. Here are the guys, my crew. So I, in my book, I talk all about these characters, including Boss Man. Never smiled. Two times I took a photo. Two times he smiled for the photo. Everybody thinks he's like the nicest guy on the earth. <laughs> How does he do that? Uh, one of the female gardeners of Japan I met. Uh, one of the advanced workers. Who's, he is a hard worker, but he's jovial. There's my boss taking a nap next to his typical craftsman tools. The pruning shears, the saw, and the cell phone. <laughs> They're all on their cell phones during breaks. These guys work hard. I talk six to seven days a week, um, 10 to 12 hour days, 15 years before you can start training on your own. Probably $5 an hour, 15 years. When they could get easily, they could go study computers and get a high paying job within three years. Weekends, where do they go on Sunday? They go to nature to try and camping so they learn about what nature actually looks like. These guys, they love nature and they love looking at native scenes and trying to learn from them. And what are the wild mountain plants and what are those string plants? And they're just, they work so hard because, like us, they love nature and they want to recreate that in gardens. So they have so much to teach us. And I try and describe this in this book, like who these guys are, what it was, what they thought of this California gardener who was equally determined, but perhaps not as skilled always, but determined. And they care more about how hard you try it and how well you do, I think, you see. Here's the American, Wikia is the gardener. Here's a mirror uh, on the, we got the Anderson Garden on the left, top, Portland Japanese Garden, top right. <coughs> we got a San Francisco private home garden with the Merritt College Pruning Club on the left. The bottom of 25th Avenue in San Francisco, there's a beautiful little Japanese garden, the very bottom of 25th kind of just to the right, just look over this low fence. There's a fence you can just peek, you can peek over. And it's a sweet little <coughs> 50s style Japanese garden. My, one of my mentors who's mentioned in the book, um, Masi Mizumi, he 
planted it in the 50s and then pruned it up until now. And the house just got sold, so I don't know if the garden will still be there in a year. And the uh, Lakeside Park Japanese Garden Merritt College Pruning Club. So thank you so much. Um, my website is lessiebuckauthor.com. <coughs> There's more pictures of my Japanese garden journey that are in the book on the website under photo diary. Um, is it Kiki Kiki? Who came up and asked me to sign her book? What was her name? Ting Ting. Ting Ting. She said she found it, these photo diary. And um, if you come visit my garden on the Bring Back the Tour website, Bring Back the Native t Garden Tour in the spring, we're going to have some wars for the kids. <laughs> and um, there's even a little coyote in the garden. Maybe you can find it. Thank you, California Native Plant Society. You're like my, the people who do what I'm most interested in, native plants. And Friends of the Library for hosting us. I have a Facebook that's very active under just Leslie Buck. And it's public. You can just go look at all my nature. I was just in Marseille and at Monet's Garden. So I do all kinds of nature. But we'll see natives. Um, I'm selling my book here. But you can buy my book. Any bookstore you can ask for it. Um, there's all kinds of online. My website shows you how you can get to places if you're interested in um, buying this book about these guys interested in native gardening. And um, I am interested in starting a group where we go out into native areas and we sketch, photograph, and write poetry. Um, so if anyone is interested in helping me lead that or joining it, then please um, send me your name on my website. There's a contact form because I'm not. And just buy your little book plates. So in addition to buying books, if I have these book plates that if you want to buy your book from Amazon or you already have a book at home, I sketch these book plates in different public gardens, and you can purchase one for three dollars, and I'll sign it, and you can just glue stick it in your book. Or if we run out of books, that's what I was afraid of. People can buy these. Um, yeah. Thank you. And that's it. Yeah, I'm definitely going to